Hey guys, Phil slash Polly going here, and welcome to part six in a purist's guide to character building. I'm actually kind of proud of myself for making it through that with as straight a face as I did. There has been a wee bit of a delay between parts five and part six in this series. I will talk to that at the end, but for now, you know what? We're going to pretend like we didn't miss a beat. Let's pretend we just concluded our run through the catacombs. Let's pretend we just killed Pinwheel. Uh, and most importantly, let's pretend we didn't take a very unfortunate step off of that ledge right there and plummet to our doom. So we're going down into the Tomb of Giants, continuing to build our PvP character from scratch in Dark Souls. Faith and Spears, man. Here we go. Pause. So, for transparency, and given the delay, I should tell you this is not the same character that began our little adventure all those many months ago, years ago, actually. Uh, that save file has long since been lost or deleted. Um, it's missing. It's chilling with Tupac somewhere down in Cuba. It is just gone. It is long gone and not coming back. But I meticulously followed what we did in parts one through five to get us back to this point. Along the way, there were a couple of exceptions which I captured and I'm going to detail starting now. Difference the first. So calling back to episode three, that's the one where we went down into the depths to do a little bit of fundraising. We took out the gaping dragon for his whopping 25,000 souls, which is a good chunk of change early on for a, a budding new character. Upon homeward boning back to Firelink, I ran up this little rise, jumped over to the aqueduct and grabbed that rare, it's not a rare ring, it's just a ring of sacrifice, which I have big, big plans for as we proceed down into the Tomb of Giants. So very important. Remember that I picked that up. So where did that come from? Okay, difference the second. After taking out Quelog in episode four, rang the Bell of Awakening just like normal. And then I actually proceeded on down into the Demon Ruins. My goal being to take out Ceaseless Discharge. Again, just another fundraising effort. This has become a pretty common technique. A lot of people do this in their runs. I don't know why I didn't do it the first time around, but basically, Ceaseless Discharge, you can cheese him something fierce, and you get the souls of two bosses after taking out Quelog, kind of for the price of one. So I'll show you that. The dude, it, Ceaseless Discharge, he is absolutely hapless. And to be fair, this isn't 100% money grubbing, or souls grubbing, I guess. It does save you a little bit of time. Clearing out the lava by defeating Ceaseless Discharge at this point does save you a little bit of time in backtracking when you have to come back this way. Uh, after you've placed the Lord Vessel and proceed on into Lost Isolate. So here's the deal, right? You got, you got Ceaseless. Just sitting there looking all sad, all morose. Oh, I'm Ceaseless Discharge. I miss my family. Completely docile. Won't do anything to you until you attack him or snag this costume belonging to his deceased sister. Now on the way out, his initial attack there, his weird hapless arm flail, is time such that if you grab the loot and just bolt, it will probably tag you. That's why I always put in a little bit of a delay, spin around in a circle a couple times, and then haul ass back to the fog gate. And what happens, if you haven't seen this before, so his little platform back there over my character's right shoulder, his lava platform does not extend all the way back to the fog gate. So I think he sees you grab the clothes belonging to his sister. He says, no, that's all I have left of her. How dare you? Makes one last desperate effort to stop you from leaving, lunges from his platform, clinging for dear life onto this little outcropping. All you gotta do, run up to him, poke him a couple of times, and he will plummet into the depths below. Which I think is kind of funny, because he actually just falls into more lava. But I, the dude can apparently live in lava, but cannot survive a fall. Gravity kills all creatures in Souls games. Important tip. Another difference, in the catacombs, Across that first bridge, you can bust a right, take the little drop as I just did, and there's a couple of crystal lizards hanging out down here. Now, these bastards do have the capability to drop white titanite chunks. That one didn't. It's not a 100% drop, but we'll give it the old quit and reload trick. Nice little tip. If you haven't seen that before, you ever miss a lizard, just don't move, quit the game, reload it. When it fires back up, they will respawn. You'll be right on top of them. Don't have to chase them down. They're a lot easier to get that way. 
Um, so we did pick up some chunks. Absolutely worth a try as you're putting together a faith build because those chunks, the white titanite variety, are pretty few and far between. A little bit tough to come by until you hit Tomb of the Giants or until you're at the very end of the game. So another difference. Got this big giant skeleton who falls from the ceiling. Actually, I think I commented on it in the last episode. It was like, that's weird, he didn't fall. He was just waiting for me and the stones fell. Whatever. We're gonna grab our Dark Moon Seance Ring. I do have plans for that. I don't necessarily have interest in the buff that we'll get for joining up with the uh, Dark Moon kids, but I have a lot of interest in the talisman we get from them. The Dark Moon Talisman, best faith scaling talisman in the game. We'll talk to that a little bit down the way. So right up this rise, Another Necromancer is waiting for us. I'm just kind of goofing around with my Partisan here, still getting a feel for it. I'm trying to get some little pass-through shots, some little dead angle shots on him through the wall there. I must say, I love this thing so far. Uh, but we'll talk, to, we'll talk about that down the way. I'm hoping to God he drops a Skull Lantern. Spoiler, he doesn't. Because we do have plans to go on into the Tomb of Giants. But I also wanted to come up here and pick up Tranquil Walk of Peace in Part 5. I was right around this area, got turned around a little bit, and I was like, I know it's around here somewhere. There's a ladder somewhere. Yeah, it's right fucking there. It's even got a developer-placed message at the foot of it. So in the event you're playing offline, they're still trying to tell you, hey, man, right up here, you just missed it on your last one. I don't know what happened. So we are going to snag Tranquil Walk of Peace, most infamous of miracles. Drop down, spits you out um, very near the beginning. Should be a familiar-looking area. One last extra little thing I did. So remember this Titanite Demon from Part 5 that we just completely ignored? We're going to go ahead and ignore him this time around as well, but sneak by him and grab those Eyes of Death. Those will allow us to join up with the Gravelord Servants, which is a covenant we don't necessarily have a lot of interest in being affiliated with. Maybe we'll talk about that way down the way when we come back to the Tomb of Giants and stuff like that. But hop in the coffin, wait for what feels like an eternity, man. I had forgotten how long it takes to just sit in that coffin but at the end of it it spits you out in the deepest part of the tomb of giants kind of cool this is the boss arena we will revisit way down the way when we have to come and fight nido offer him up one of those uh eyes of death allows us to join the covenant and that gives us a grave lord sword dance and some sword that some people like but this character doesn't have an interest in weird little miracle that grave lord sword dance i i guess i say it's weird because uh, Damage-wise, it's just a regular-ass miracle. It scales with your faith and your magic adjustment of your talisman, just like Wrath of the Gods or Lightning Spear or any of those. Um, but the AoE of it actually scales with your Covenant Devotion, which I think is kind of interesting. So if you are really, really deep into your grave, Lorden, and you're in tight with these guys, you will actually have a more potent AoE for your miracle, for your Grave Lord Sword Dance and your its bigger cousin, the Grave Lord Great Sword Dance. I don't know if we're going to have a lot of opportunities to play with that, but it's nice to have in the arsenal, so I went ahead and picked it up for our build. Uh, also, watch your six on the way out. This guy, Titanite Demon, is probably going to be taking a swipe at you. He resets to wherever you left him from the eternity spent in the coffin. And that's it. A couple of things we did differently. Just wanted to point those out. I mentioned I might make an appendix for things I missed in the catacombs. Maybe I'll consider that the appendix. Just a couple extra things to pick up, point out. And from there, we're going to proceed into the Tomb of Giants. Now, I kind of feel like this area can be a little bit prickly for a build of any level. You got some bigger enemies down here that hit pretty hard. You got the crushing darkness working against you. We're lower level, craptastic gear. Can't advance past it because we haven't placed the Lord Vessel. Uh, no light of any kind. Might be a little bit insane, but we're playing the risk-reward game. We came down here for the Large Divine Ember and to rescue Rhea of Thuraland. Those two things for our faith build early on are going to be so invaluable, it's worth the danger. And we can see our first bonfire there. I'm kind of going through an evaluation. Do I sit or do I not sit? Advantages of not sitting is basically just the escape. Escaping from the Tomb of Giants is not an easy run. It's long, you have to go all the way back through the catacombs. Um, that skeleton kind of made up my mind for me. He fell down from above, was kind of blocking the bonfire, and was like, well, I guess we're not sitting. We'll try our courage, feeling lucky. Um, advantages of sitting there would be just basically establishing a base camp down here. It is pretty treacherous. If we were to die, we would not have to manually run back here. We would just respawn at the bonfire. Um, also gives you some farming opportunities. 
also unlocks a shortcut later because that's one of the bonfires you can warp to after placing the Lord Vessel. So it's nice having that active, but we're going to press on without it. We just met Patches too. Fell into his dastardly trap. There is a Skull Lantern down here. Um, I'll talk about Patches in a second. I was just kind of goofing around with the Skull Lantern to see if I could use it in my right hand. I couldn't remember if you could. You cannot. You must use it instead of a shield. I was kind of hoping I could use the Skull Lantern in my right, still shield up, maybe swap out to my Partisan for Reposts and things like that. No, no. Gotta use it instead of a shield. Now, throwing back to Patches, remember we did not see him in the catacombs. Also, remember we didn't see Rhea at any point. We did not see her and her fellows up in Firelink. Um, you do not need to talk to them. You do not need to run into any of them for these events to move forward. You basically just have to hit a couple loading screens, kill a couple of bosses, get to a point where she would show up in Firelink, uh, and then she'll come down here with her expedition. Unsuccessful expedition. And here she is. Helpless, naive little cleric of Thoroughland, abandoned, fell into Patch's trap. There's her hollow companions off in the distance looking so ominous. Man, so Vince and Nico, these guys can be a little bit tricky. They've gone completely hollow. They're trying to kill Rhea, trying to kill you, probably trying to kill anybody that falls down into this little ravine. They can get into some patterns that are a little tough to deal with. They, they're both clerics. They can both heal. They can both force, so they can get into some uh, force loops where one, look at him back there, just trolling with his force, where the other one's coming up and hitting you with the weapon can be a little bit tough to deal with, especially early on for a low level character. So when I, you know, hit a parry against one of these guys, I make no hesitation to be as cheap as possible. Go into chain BS mode, um, use the columns to your advantage, chug in their face, do whatever you got to do to take these guys out, especially not have, ooh, careful you don't hit Rhea. Especially not having sat at the bonfire, it would absolutely suck to lose to these two jokers and then have to come back down here all the way from the catacombs. So just be a little careful with them. Just get the parry timings down. Uh, they're also pretty susceptible to the old classic. Just lock on, circle strafe to your land of BS. Um, and once you kill one of them, like as a single entity, they, they ain't got nothing. Wow, looking awfully sloppy with our parry timings there. My shield is rusty. Need to blow the dust off of some of this stuff. And we'll go in for the chain just to finish him off. When you do kill him, you do need to go back and talk to Rhea. I think that triggers her, air quote, rescue. And she'll proceed to escape up to the old undead parish. She doesn't actually sell you anything down here. You do need to meet up with her later. That's kind of lame. We got a nice chunk of souls on us. We could actually pick up some pretty sweet stuff right here and now. I guess it makes sense, though, considering she's been through a fairly traumatic experience. Fell into Patch's trap, betrayed by a guide that she trusted to take her down here. Petrus, you ass. Childhood friends trying to kill her. She's had a pretty rough day, so we'll give her a little bit of a chance to uh, regain her composure. Maybe she'll be in more of a mood for commerce down the way. Before leaving this little ravine, too, I'm looking for this rise here. Because at the top of it is one of the few, I think one of two, free white titanite chunks in the game. One of two chunks just lying around for you to pick up that you don't have to kill something for or farm for or anything like that. When we grab it, there's going to be a couple of these bone tower enemies that pop up from the floor below us. Those bone towers also have a chance to randomly drop white titanite chunks. That's why I'm firing off a couple humanities here. It's a pretty rare drop from those guys. So having your 10 humanity, having any kind of uh, item increase equipment, your covetous gold serpent ring and stuff like that definitely helps. Given that we didn't sit at the bonfire, we can't just sit here and indefinitely farm. So I'm doing what I can to try and make it out of here with as many chunks as possible. We're fairly weak against them with our partisan just standing back and chipping away. They can be a little bit dicey. Uh -huh. Get it? Because they've got this move where uh, it's kind of a whirly gig thing, where they will just start to spin around in a circle with their bone blades outstretched. If you're in tight with them, like if you have a shorter range weapon, you have to get close to them, that can deplete your health bar mighty quickly. Luckily, our partisan has some range. We can just stand back from afar, poke, poke, poke. Basically be everybody's favorite spear user. I've been busting out my lantern from time to time too, just to kind of get a read on things. Even though you can lock on to these guys in the darkness when you can't necessarily see them, the reticle doesn't give you any indication of distance or spacing. 
So I will lock on, usually poke a little bit, back off, flood the area with some light with my lantern, and then just kind of mentally keep track of where everything is. Hooray! A chunk! And any chunks we can make it out of here with are absolutely icing on the cake. Um, we came down here primarily for Rhea, check, and the large divine ember, but if we make it out with a stack of chunks, ain't nobody gonna be complaining. Those chunks, those white titanite chunks, are actually decently rare. Aside from those lizards in the catacombs and that one random black knight with the great axe that we took out in the catacombs, and actually took us out too, the uh, Tomb of Giants is the only place where you can get them. There's a couple lying around, you can farm a couple of the enemies down here. There's another black knight that drops one. Uh, and actually speaking of black, black knights, so that, nope, that's not true. The best place to get white titanite chunks is if you want to wait till the absolute end game. In fact, I think the very last enemy you fight in the entire game before taking on the final boss has a 100% drop rate of white titanite chunks. Personally, I like to have my shit a little bit together before reaching absolute end game. But if we wanted to flesh out the arsenal with any other weapons or something like that. That guy is a great source for chunks. But primarily, it's it's Tomb of the Giants. Tomb of the Giants for white chunks. You know what? Correct myself again. There's one other place where you can get chunks. We're gonna do this when we make it out of here. Oh, sorry. No spoilers. If we make it out of here, you can trade a Sunlight Medal with Snuggly the Crow back at the Undead Asylum for a single chunk. One per playthrough. So not a great source, but hey, we will take them where we can get them. And we found this ladder. At the top of this, it spits you out, kind of overlooking that bonfire that we didn't sit at. So if you were to farm those bone towers, this would be basically your route. Sit at the uh, bonfire, drop down into Patch's trap, kill the towers, climb the ladder, repeat, repeat, repeat. Also spits us out pretty close to where we want to be for the large divine ember right down that hole. Be careful, there's a couple of large asshole skeletons shooting slow-moving arrows. Yeah, there's one. Two of them. Nah, that arrow's intentional. Fashion souls! Dropping down that hole, hopefully quicker than I did, so you don't get tagged, is the large divine ember. It's that one, the far one, way off in the distance, and guarded by a football team of giant, hard-hitting, stun-locking, shield-stomping skeletons. And they will absolutely converge on you as soon as you set foot on the ground. So I equip, I equip that ring of sacrifice that we got earlier, uh, basically making a suicide run for it. And I, I was getting a little bit clever with these alluring skulls. I wasn't sure if the giant skeletons would pay attention to them. Uh, they don't. I think those only work on peon-style enemies. Maybe things your size and smaller with the exception of those boars. But I was hoping I could throw those down there as a distraction. Maybe the skeletons would chase them instead of me. No, no. Giant skeletons down there are just kind of laughing at me. Ha ha ha. We see through your path pathetic ruse. We're gonna come step on you. So we're currently just mustering our courage. We've got our ring equipped as an insurance policy, so we don't lose any of that sweet humanity we just popped off. We won't lose any of our pinwheel souls. We're making a break for it. Here they come out of the darkness. Oh my god. Too many bones. Too many bones. But we did get the ember. Whatever happens now, who cares? Oh my god, look at them all. It's like an anatomy class gone awry. Oh my god. Okay, but mission accomplished, man. We picked up... The large divine ember. We rescued Rhea. And from that ring revival, we started pretty deep back in the catacombs, fairly near the entrance. That is absolutely worth some joy. You joy it up, Tune. In all, I'm pretty happy with that run. Ran through the catacombs in part 5. Got some really nice treasures from the Tomb of Giants, at least the parts we could access. And from here, all we gotta do is just uh, beat our way through some much less ominous skeletons, escape from the catacombs, and we can head back to the Undead Parish. That kind of um, satisfies both of the things that we're looking for, because we'll go pay Andre a visit, give him the Divine Ember, feed him some chunks so that we can ascend our partisan, and on the way we'll also meet up with Rhea, who's going to be up there praying up a storm, and purchase some big boy miracles, or some big girl miracles, I guess as the case may be. So we'll hit that, and then, oh, how convenient, we're right at the gates of Sen's Fortress, which will be the next part that we tackle in the series. That'll be the next chunk of the game that we take on. Um, and actually, on my way back to the parish, I think I'm going to jump off the elevator on the ride and stop off at the Undead Asylum to, well, I better specify, it's the Northern Undead Asylum. Not to be, <laughs> not to be confused with the Southern Undead Asylum. 
where all the undead drive pickup trucks and are trying to secede. Um, we're gonna stop off at the Northern Undead Asylum and trade one of our random sunlight medals with Snuggly, just to snag one last little chunk. So that way when we hit Andre, we have as many chunks available to us as possible. Uh, we can take our partisan, I think, up to plus eight. That'll give us a total of six chunks, and we'll be good to go. So it's a pretty standard run back. I'm just gonna let that play out as we go to gear up, and we'll take this opportunity to address one of the elephants in the room, one of the many elephants in the room. Namely, where the hell has this series been? Your voice sounds different. It does sound different. Uh, because there's an additional two years of wisdom in it, or two years of idiocy in it, depending on who you ask. Part 5 of The Purist's Guide to Character Building came out in early December of 2013. That sounds like a fucking lifetime ago, doesn't it? And so, why return to it now? You know, Dark Souls 2 is still going, Bloodborne is still going, Dark Souls 3 is on the horizon. Why would we come back to Dark Souls 1 for a PvE series? That's an excellent question, elephant in the room. Um, and there's, there's a couple of reasons. So one, selfish, just for me. I'm coming back to it just for me. I started playing Dark Souls again, and I am absolutely having a blast. And I also have never finished a series on this channel. This, this channel is filled with nothing but orphaned PvE runs. So 2016 kicks off. One of my resolutions is, God damn it, man, have a little bit more conviction. Have a little bit more tenacity and finish some of this shit. So I'm coming back. I'm having fun playing the game. I thought it would be cool to, to bring back our partisan politics character and just finish the series and just feel a little bit better about myself and the channel and actually get one of these things done. So I'm doing it for me for one. Two, I'm doing it for you, man. This series, parts one through five, actually still get a little bit of action, a pretty good deal of action and still get a lot of comments on them. And most of those comments are the tune of Dude, what the fuck, brother? Why did you leave this thing just hanging? Where is part six? So I'm trying to do right by that. I am, I, I sincerely, like in all earnestness, I really apologize for leaving anybody that was following this series hanging. Uh, I did not mean to burn you guys with it. I was trying to finish it by the time Dark Souls 2 came out. Wasn't able to do that. Just dropped the ball and I'm circling back for it now. If you guys have moved on, Super cool. I do not blame you, but it is kicking off again, and I think it's, no, I think no, it's timely. Not that enough. Reason the third, timely. Weird. What? Dark Souls 1? This thing has been out forever. People have played it a million different ways. Why, why would you pick a PvE series in a four going on five year old game no, to return no. to? Well, with Dark Souls 3 coming out, I think a lot of new people are going to come to the franchise, and they're probably going to start looking through From's back catalog. They'll go to Dark Souls 2, and they'll go all the way back to Dark Souls 1, maybe even to Demon Souls. So I think people are, are going to be playing this game for the first time and might find something like this helpful. Also, this game is damn timeless, man. This is the type of game that gets in your blood, which is why a lot of us are still playing it. To this day. I don't think it's the kind of thing that is ever really going to go away. So I think at any time, if anybody wants to do a Dark Souls PvE run, it will be relevant. These videos are actually a blast to make too. I, you know, in thinking back on the time that I've been making YouTube videos, these purist guides, one through five, I think were some of the most enjoyable videos I have ever put together. And it has haunted me, absolutely haunted me for two years that I left them out there just kind of hanging. As morbid as it is, I think if I were to die, like in real life, if I was to die, I might come back as a revenant and haunt the living until the purist's guide was completed. Pause for a moment in pensive reflection. While we talk to Rhea, we'll bring it back, we'll bring it back to the game. I'm just kind of checking her inventory. I wanted to see if she sold anything item-wise that I could put to use. Not really. So I'm going to go ahead and pick up Great Heal and Wrath of the Gods. I want to make sure I pick up those two miracles because keep in mind that Petrus is still alive. We didn't run into him on the way up here. He wasn't in Firelink. He's probably still down in the Tomb of Giants or the Catacombs doing something nefarious. But he is still alive. And while he is alive and Rhea is alive, there is a very real danger that he will sneak up here and kill her. 
And we don't want that to happen before we get what we need. We could also kill him later, but I'd hate to come back here to buy Wrath of the Gods or Great Heal or something else and find just a glowing pile of seven humanity and a pendant where Rhea used to be the pendant. Symbol of fond memories. Which is kind of funny too, that she leaves that behind. I mean, what fond memories are these that she has? They must be of home. They must be of Thoroughland and her childhood growing up in the royal family back in Thoroughland. Or they might be of your rescuing her. They certainly can't be of the time when she was abandoned and left to die in the Tomb of Giants, right? They, sh they certainly can't be from when her childhood buddies, her dear friends, went completely hollow and were trying to kill her. I don't know what these fond memories are that she's leaving behind, but she does. So we just want to... That's my... <laughs> That's my large Divine Ember happy dance before we talk to Andre. So we'll upgrade our Partisan. It sucks that we weren't able to eke out just one more chunk and ascend it all the way to plus 9. Plus 9 is where your weapons, your Divine Weapons at least, max out their scaling. And then you can upgrade them with a slab to get max base damage. But I feel pretty good about part, uh, plus 8. Moving into Sens, moving into An Orlando. I feel good about the miracles we just picked up. So... We're good to advance. I think in the next next episode we'll take on Sens. We might do a little bit of fashion hunting too. I'm not crazy about our leather pants. But that's going to do it for this one. So as always, thoughts, feedback, comments, greatly appreciated. Let me know what I got wrong. What did I miss? What do you do differently? What do you feel about the series coming back? I'm very curious to know. wanted to thank everybody for... Oh, thank everybody for 2015 and for watching, for listening, for paying attention. We'll keep this going. I promise you. Absolutely promise you. I don't want to be a ghost. We're going to finish this thing. All right. See you on the next one.